Hi, I'm Meta Spence. Hi. And um, I want to um, I want to ask you whether or not you think that you, um, if you get poisoned, or if you get into a stress situation that affects your health, you think that's going to be something that's transmitted to your children and grandchildren through genes? Well, conventionally, and until very recently, it was laughed at, the idea that that was true. There was a guy named Lamarck who postulated that uh, inherited or acquired, or rather acquired the traits could be transmitted uh, through the genes, hereditary. And uh, when I was in high school, and in fact, until a few years ago, we laughed at that idea. I was taught to ridicule uh, the notion. But lately, it turns out that uh, indeed, there are such effects. If you are in a stressful environment or chemically toxic environment, things can happen to you that means that you will transmit your these some of these uh, characteristics onto your offspring. And uh, this is something we need to think about because we don't want to pass on ne negative uh, traits to our uh, succeeding generations. And um, But I don't know enough about genomics or about how heredity actually works. So I've asked a friend of mine, Michelle Dubois, to help me get straightened out about how um, genes actually work, how our bodies actually transmit hereditary traits to the next generation. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Duguay is a, uh, an engineering professor at Laval University. He's a physicist, and he's become very interested in genomics lately, which is a burgeoning field of research. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Meta. Good to see you. Same now, here. Yes, okay. I, I, I'm uh, going to eventually get around to asking you uh, questions about epigenetics, but let's start off with the sort of basic, well, it, it, when I was in school, they didn't know all this, so they couldn't have trans taught me when I was in school. First slide. <clears throat> sure. That's good. All right. That's good. I can start with that. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> What you're seeing here is um, a little girl in the center. Actually, she was my grandmother. <clears throat> she's shown there at about five years of age. And uh, she's standing in front of her parents, my two maternal grandparents. And uh, what we've shown in the illustration is the uh, genes, the DNA inside the little girl, inside the man and the woman. Mm -hmm. And then as you go up, uh, you can see the great-grandparents, generation number three, then generation number four, generation number five. So if we look at one... I'm sorry. Uh, these, are, um, th these are generations here. So three, four, and five, meaning That's right. th the fifth generation back, ancestors, right? Yes. Uh, put put your pointer on uh, one of the uh, DNA uh, segments. Like this? Well, yeah, just... Uh -huh. yeah. Is that a DNA segment right here? No, no a, a no. DNA segment is like, like a little a bar. A little, little, oh, no, red, a, a little, green. Just a little bar. Okay. little bar. So, all right. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, here on this diagram, I'm showing how this little segment was transmitted to uh, my maternal grandmother from the great-grandmother, and then it came above from, at generation number four, the great-great-grandparent, and so on until generation five. Now, uh, what's... What's interesting about this diagram is that, you see, one thing I'm pushing for is that each person could consider herself, himself, to be an amalgam of many gene fragments that come from millions of ancestors. If you go back just one generation, you have two parents. If you go back one more generation, four grandparents, but then you're down at you're up at eight, 
etc. So the farther you go back, the more people have contributed to what you are. So from a genomics point of view, you are a representative all of ma all of mankind. When you go back to 1400, people have done studies on this. If you go back to 1400 before Christ, basically you and I and everybody else you know, we can we have genes coming from the same pool of ancestors. So you cannot say I'm intrinsically Scottish or Irish or Australian or Latin American. We all come when you go back far enough. We all come back from the same pool of ancestors. So as the genomics authors write in their many books, we are all part of the same family from a genomics point of view. Now, if we can go down to the next slide, the important point is that these genes you're seeing over there, this, they're spread out all around. I can see my genetic continuity in the children of other people. I don't have to have seven or eight children to see that I will continue in the future. All the, gen the genes are tremendously well conserved. If, when you look at one letter of DNA, the, as, it rep as the DNA replicates, the probability that that letter will change through a mutation is one in a hundred million. So when you study genes, you find that over the centuries, they have evolved very slowly. That's why you can look at Roman statues, statues of the Roman times, and the, these people look at identical to us. More than that, we are unearthing their bones and their teeth all over the place. And we, the oldest Homo sapiens who has been uh, sequenced for its DNA, I think is about 30,000 years. So already 30,000 years ago, the genes were not all that different from what they are today. The combinations change, but the genes themselves, they're very well preserved. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, I have a philosophical uh, uh, interest, very deep, and uh, uh, an author like Matt Ridley, whom I like very much, he works for the BBC, has pointed out in his book called Human Genome that the, the human genome is a treasure of philosophical lessons and philosophical riddles. Now, what are we, the obvious thing when you read about DNA in the many books and articles and television programs is that DNA is really good at reproduction. If you don't believe me, just read up the news on the coronavirus. You can see how well the DNA, the RNA, it's RNA close to DNA. The RNA of this coronavirus is reproducing very well, very fast. Mm -hmm. So part of life then, at the very core of life, is this idea of reproduction done in a very reliable way. In a sense, if I make myself the voice of DNA, I would say, say to you, well, look, Meta, us DNA guys, we've been working at this for three billion years, and uh, we, we can now reproduce lions, tigers, giraffes, human beings with an extremely good reliability. So uh, anything you do with your civilization, you should see about preserving the, the genome which means don't eat pesticides, you know, minimize the amount of pesticides you can go to food. Don't, don't go get into wars, especially nuclear wars. Uh, you know, the great lesson of DNA is faithful reproduction. An example of this faithful reproduction is identical twins. If you look at two identical twins, you can tell the pattern on the left twin and the pattern, DNA pattern on the right twin is expressed in the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the first important le lesson, to preserve the, uh, the genome. And that's one good argument against nuclear war because nuclear war with radioactive fallout, uh, we could lose the beautiful genome that we have now. It could become altered in a way which is, 
we can modify genes, but it's done one by one, only on animals in the lab, not on human beings. So I would not recommend a nuclear war because uh, what, what would happen to the human genome? Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, proteins. Well, there are five kinds of proteins in your body. The simplest one to understand is the protein that functions like a brick. If you are on the microscopic scale and you wanted to build anything, a brick wall, a brick tower, anything, you just make a brick using chemical means, which becomes self-assembling. That's one of the secrets of life. The DNA encodes uh, the, uh, protein, uh, messenger RNA, as you call it, which in turn makes proteins. Uh, a, a protein is a chain of amino acids. An amino acid, an example is alanine, another example is valine. You see, these are simple molecules, five or six atoms, or at most 12 atoms, or t t two dozen atoms. And these are very clever molecules, these amino acids, because they can link up and they, they can, the, the way the DNA uses them, he puts them, the DNA puts them in a chain and the chain folds itself. It's shown in the, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you could bring that one up at the bottom. No, it's hidden. Uh, it's, it's, the next, it's the next slide. Oh, okay. The ribbon, you know, the ribbon? There's a ribbon there. There, yeah. that it. Bring that ribbon up. Oh, dear. Oops. Where'd it go? Here, come back here. Here we go. Yeah, bring the ribbon up. Okay, good. Now, this is a, a symbolic, a very simplified way of representing a protein but it's basically a long chain of amino acids. And the properties, the clever properties of these amino acids is that they will tend to cling together or repel each other. They will interact with the water, which is in the cell, and they will form a uniquely defined three-dimensional shape. That's another miracle of life or another secret of life to start from linear information, your DNA is two meters long. If I were to take your cell, Meta, and if I was patient enough to unfold the DNA in one of your cells, it would make a chain two meters high. So the beauty of nature is to take information in a linear way, transform it into a three-dimensional structure, and that three-dimensional structure, as an example, is a brick that can self-assemble. You, you could make a car. They've even done that in the lab. They make a, a protein that looks like a car, just for fun. <laughs> Be because nowadays, you can order DNA. You could send a letter today to a, a company in California and say, I want this sequence, and they will send it to you. So you can make whatever DNA, whatever RNA you want, and once you have it, it will form, if you, depending how you design it, a really good brick or at least a functional brick. So that's one example, the brick. Another example is... Now, well, hold on. Is this one brick or one what? This one was, brick. This is one brick. That's and a these, brick. If you get another one like this, it's going to glom on to some part of... Uh, they're going to link together like a Lego blocks. Is that right? This is a, this is a real existing brick. It's in my book. I've, I don't, by memory, I don't remember exactly what the, the name of this protein is. But, you know, we have about 20,000 genes, mm -hmm. which code 20,000 kinds of proteins. Oh, so, well, then how, how, I thought you said there are just five, five or six kinds of proteins, this ALA, et cetera. So how do you get 20,000 out of them? Well, uh, it's because people classify them, you know. But when they combine, then the those make the 20,000 kinds of... Um, no, no, there are, it's like uh, if you went to a university that what, had 20,000 departments and uh, students who would had the choice of 20,000 departments to study in. 
There are 20,000 different kinds of proteins. Now, the biologists have classified them in five groups. But, you know, it's like classifying Americans from Texas and Americans from New York City and oh. Americans from Seattle. Okay, so all of these, all of these are individual. There's 20,000 individual-like things, and you cluster them and categorize them within a category, five or six categories. Yeah, so let me give you another example of a category. Okay. Uh, protein, proteins are used by your body to communicate all over the place. You can have cells in your brain that send out DNA in the blood and it goes elsewhere and, and will trigger other cells to do something. Cells in your body communicate. You know you have about 10 trillion cells in your body mm -hmm. and they communicate. And mm -hmm. uh, they communicate through proteins. So you can look, you can look at proteins as uh, uh, as communication means. Another one is transport. You know, cells move around and uh, there are proteins that specialize in that. They help you move left or right or up or down. Another kind of protein uh, helps to carry food into your cells. You know, mm -hmm. you're, when you eat, you go in the stomach and elsewhere. And at some point, the, the good food has to be put in a cell that needs it. And there are proteins that do that. When you have 20,000 kinds of, of uh, proteins, it, it's like a company with 20,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And people who have companies with that many employees, they do a lot of stuff. Your interest and your enthusiasm is for the continuity and the stability and the, rep the, the reliability with which these things reproduce so that the, the transmission from one generation to another is, there are very few mutants. Is that right? Is that the general message? Well, that's one message, but I have several messages. Okay. Um, my main preoccupation is the same as you. It's uh, avoiding nuclear war. Now, um, way back in my life, uh, I saw a cartoon by uh, some peace activist, and uh, he was looking at Earth from the point of view of astronauts from Mars coming to visit. And the Martians are looking at Earth, and they see hundreds of missiles with nuclear weapons on the east and hundreds, if not thousands, of missiles on the left coming from the west. And they're pointing at each other. And the Martians are saying, well, these people are not very smart. Uh, every astronaut has made this kind of comment. When you're on the moon and you look at Earth, you see how beautiful the Earth is, especially compared to the moon. Uh, how shameful it is to have these nuclear arsenals that could destroy almost everything on Earth. From the point of view of Martian astronauts coming and orbiting the Earth, a good question they could ask th themselves, these uh, Martians, uh, shall we land on Earth? I'm not sure if I were a Martian that would recommend landing on Earth. You know, there are Americans who are willing to drop bombs on the Russians because they're different, because they, had their, they were communist or atheist or whatever. So, you know, uh, the collective intelligence on Earth has to go up, has to go up at least one notch, and I would say even three notches. Mm -hmm. And so I believe very much in the strength of the individual person. You, you've encountered this idea in the States, as I have. That's why I learned it. The individual can make a difference. and uh, But for the individual to make a difference, he has to have a lot of confidence in himself, like you. Uh, so to me, it's obvious when you think about your self-identity that it should include your genome. I mean, your genome made what you are, even wired your brain. 
So to a great extent, you are the expression of your genome. If you had an identical twin, that would be the proof of it. You'd be surprised how similar your identical twins would be to you. So you are, as, as I see you, and if you get, you should get your genome sequenced. Uh, it's down to $600. Really? What would, it, Six, what, what would I do with it? <laughs> you would put it in a USB key. I've done it in my family already. Really? There are several in my family who would like to get that USB key with my genome. Well, it will have medical applications, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, this is a kind of scientific immortality for just $600. Well, okay. Now, now, when uh, is there going to be a time when they'll be able to take this out of that safety deposit box or whatever and put it in a Petri dish and raise a new Michelle? Well, it will take some time. But there's a Chinese guy who's working on this already. Yeah, I've heard that there are people in Ch there's at least one guy who's actually who claims he has cloned a human being. Is that what what that would amount to? A clone? Yeah. Would that be yes, a clone? But, but I don't believe that he's done it. It's no. uh, especially if you start from a, a computer language DNA sequence. If you start from a living cell, then cloning is done all, all the time in South Korea. There are many Americans who have their cats and dogs and whatever. Uh, cloned in South Korea, but starting from a living cell. Really? But starting from a USB key, that's going to take uh, some time yet. Okay. Well, suppose they freeze one of your, your cells and keep it. Could they uh, clone that pretty soon? So we well, have a new Michelle. Yeah, well, that has been done already. Really? Yeah, well, with animals. With human, human beings? Not allowed. Totally illegal. Uh, well, should it be illegal? I, well, I don't. I understand. I, I guess I understand the reluctance, but I, I don't understand exactly the argument one, one way or another. Americans, when they learned about cloning, within weeks, they had a law passed in Congress. They did not want to have another Fidel Cast Castro or hundreds of Fidel Castros and no new Stalin and no new Adolf Hitler. What, know, if, they, what if, how about a new uh, Albert Einstein or well, a new yeah. Beethoven? Well, I would, I would vote in favor of that, but how many Albert Einsteins would you want? <laughs> <laughs> how many? Yeah. Think well, about it. And, 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 of course, then you, you wonder, suppose we have an Albert Einstein starting from where the old Albert Einstein left off and continuing the, the thought process that, that he, he got as far as he could go in looking at trying to find a unified field theory. Well, now, he's a, he would be very well qualified to be the person who would move the whole theory up a few notches, Right. Uh, so uh, how, you know, I guess, how similar would people's thinking be? Maybe, maybe it turns, you know, he liked to play the, I think he played the violin. Maybe, in fact, this new Albert Einstein would turn out to be a violinist and not a physicist. Um, and if so, would he play the same way that the old Al Albert Einstein did? Or would he rather play jazz? Uh, or uh, hip hop music. <laughs> uh, it, see, what I'm I'm driving at is how how much would genetics affect our tendency to think along, you know, in certain ways, and um, would you get a a Beethoven who uh, really did, wasn't interested in music, but was was a, a good farmer, and he you know, et cetera. Uh, how, how much is who we are in terms of our interests and our values connected to this genome thing? Well, studies of identical twins, uh, identical twins reared apart in different families and identical twins reared in the same family. 
they show that sometimes the two twins will go into the same profession. Like they'll both become dentists and have their clinic so that when one goes on vacation, the patient don't even notice that it's not their usual dentist that's treating them. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is the following. There was a pair of identical twins in Germany where one of them became a criminal and the other one became a judge. You see, they were... <laughs> Wait, well, could one judge the other one? <laughs> they, they were both interested in crime, uh -huh. but not at the same end. Really? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of if, if brother could be brought up to the bench to face brother. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that kind of fits with the twins that I have known. One, uh, my brother-in-law is a radiologist, and his brother is, I think, a veterinarian. Uh, so close, but not exactly the same. Yeah. And when they have a conversation, do they tackle the same topics, or have the same opinions, or very different, or how have you found I, I them? Haven't, I haven't ever been around them together. Oh. I I. I have been around another set of twins who are women. Um, yeah, I would say their values are compatible. They're, they are certainly close to each other. How much of that is because they are close to each other? You know, I mean, if I, if I stayed close to somebody, I'd probably share many of their values. So how much of the, I think the whole question of, of environment versus heredity is extremely interesting, but the new angle on it has to be that it's not as clear as it used to be, because when you talk about environment as separate from and distinct from heredity, that's the way we used to look at it. But when you talk about epigenetics, there are apparently, and I've just been reading a book by uh, Peter Ward called Lamarck's Revenge, Fascinating book, and I'm going to be interviewing him next week, uh, I think a week from today. And, and, uh, but in this book, he says that, it does, that epigenetics does not change the genes. That's true. You're right. These, there's great stability and reliability of transmitting from uh, one set of genes to the next generation. But what happens is that our little things clip on to the outside of the, of the DNA, I believe, which uh, are like on and off switches. And uh, they, this happens uh, through de several different mechanisms, one being something called methylation. I, I don't even try to remember all the other ways in which this can be affected. But a methylation uh, or a, a, an epigenetic <clears throat> alteration would be something clipping on to or attaching to the side, I think, of the DNA and turning, it, turning one of them on or off that might have been turned off when you got it, when you got born. You know, your basic gen genome is this particular gene is inactive, but this, uh, some stress could come along and turn it on and, or turn one would have been on in the stress or uh, chemical uh, reaction or whatever comes along and turns one of them off. So um, that can be hereditary. And so that means that the, uh, even the personality traits that it, let's say um, you're, you're, you know, you're subjected to some sort of environmental toxin well, apparently, um, you know, this can make you bad tempered or uh, change your, your, your hormones, really it affect your hormones in a way that affect your mood or your uh, disposition or, or, or maybe your tendency toward criminality, who knows? And um, so they, uh, but this can be, um, can be inherited. So the, the, in a way, you could say this, uh, this qualifies your statement about, I would think, about the stability of 
of the genome as it moves from one generation to another, because it is affected by the environment in ways that I was taught certainly was a ridiculous idea. Um, there, I think this was discovered um, a few, gen maybe decades ago, when <clears throat> somebody studied the, the offspring of people in the Netherlands whose parents had been uh, starved during World War II. You know, there was a terrible famine uh, caused by the Germans when they occupied the Netherlands. And um, uh, people uh, starved to death in large numbers. But um, the people who survived um, had uh, epigenetic effects. And um, their offspring have tendencies toward um, issues about digestion and food processing and fat storage or whatever. At any rate, they may be um, obese or they may be uh, uh, under, uh, you know, uh, too, too skinny and unable to, to put on weight or they may have other kinds of um, nutritional issues to a degree that is not normal. It, it, it's, a, it's a reflection of the epigenetic effects. So that discovery led to a number of other um, investigations. And um, the odd thing is that um, in his book, uh, Lamarck's uh, uh, Revenge, which is a lovely title because it means, you know, Lamarck, Lamarck turns out to have been right. Uh, although he didn't know why, and his uh, understanding of, of the mechanism was completely flawed. But it turns out that heredity can transmit acquired traits, um, as, he, as he argued. Um, but in his book, Peter Ward uh, is, is addressing an interesting problem. He's somebody who specializes as a biologist in understanding the um, the great extinction events that have happened in the planet's uh, history. There have been five clear ones, and I think some others that are, you know, questionable how, how strong this, these were, but in some one case anyway, so they figure 95% of all living creatures on, on the earth went extinct. And, and yet what he says is if you look at the strata um, of where they do these, um, um, archaeological digs and uh, paleo paleology, paleontology, you find um, a way too rapid recovery. It's not that the old uh, animals that had been extinguished suddenly reappear. No, you get a whole new set of animals, but uh, the new set of animals becomes pretty well advanced within a very short period of time, meaning just a few million years, but at, um, quicker than Darwinian uh, evolution could possibly explain. So he says that Dar the Darwinian theory is inadequate because it cannot explain the very rapid development of new species um, much faster than ordinary evolution could explain. And he claims that this is because the survivors of the, ex the extinction event, such as they are, and there may be very few, but those survivors have epigenetic effects as a result of the trauma of the extinction event. And they pass this on and that gives them that gives a, a boost to the whole process of uh, developing new um, physical traits so that a, a new type of um, a mollusk or something might appear uh, almost uh, in a very advanced state within a very few million years. And uh, he attributes it, attributes it to epigenetics. So there. Now, he then uses this information for exactly the kinds of things that you are uh, arguing yourself, that we need to be extremely careful and cautious about all of the um, environmental impacts that we're, stresses that we're placing on the human genome. 
we need to be careful about nuclear war for sure. Uh, and we need to be careful about not having all these toxins in our environment. And we need to be careful about reducing stress because just stress itself, being exposed to a terrible event, even if you don't get injured, but you see other people around you dying and so on, all of these traumas have effects on the uh, hormone system, the endocrine system, and those effects can be transmitted. Uh, and he cl claims that, um, Oh, maybe limb, uh, crime rates even. He's, he's, he, here, he goes out on a limb and speculates. But he thinks that crime rates, for example, may actually be influenced by the kinds of traumas that the previous generations uh, endured and were subjected to, and that uh, uh, their, their successors, their, their progeny, uh, inherit tendencies that may uh, make them into criminals, as you've pointed out. So where you're, you're interested in the very stability of the genome, I think he's interested in the instability of the genome in the sense that it is, it is open to and susceptible to intervention by uh, good means and bad. And presumably good means simply means what you want. Protect the human genome from these stresses or these catastrophic uh, insults to survival like nuclear war. I believe that politically, your your recommendations for how to live, you know, how to create a society that's going to be decent would be exactly the same as his. Though you are looking at the stability and he's looking at the potential for crisis or instability. Yes. Can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, I think you described very well how epigenetics work. You said it's like little switches which are little switches which are put here and there to control the genes that become active out of the DNA. But can they measure, can they see now these little switches? What's nice about the DNA itself is that you can get your DNA. You could have it by tomorrow if you want. Just dole out six hundred dollars and you'll have your three billion letters in a, D in a USB key. Now, what about these little switches that epigenetics works through? C can they be seen? I don't know. Can, can, because if you can't see them, it, you know, that's why the DNA is so interesting with computer techniques. You can compare the genome of the chimpanzee with the elephants or the dolphins. Or, you can do wonders with the DNA information now. But the epigenetic one, is it, can we get our hands on it? I'll ask him because in a week I'll have a chance to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, sure. Uh, but um, uh, so I don't know that. And uh, it may simply be what he's interested in recording in his book, because his book, he's looking at uh, especially these, these long term uh, geological era uh, events, you know. And yeah. um, and and he he I don't think he anywhere pre presents in his book a, a diagram of the genome or uh, certainly any of the things that clip onto the genome. So uh, it, whether whether he he reproduced a, a, a map of the genome or not doesn't really. I mean, he might he probably wouldn't have put it in even if he could see it because he just that's not what he was writing about. But I don't know. I, I'll find out. I, I, they must know because they, they're very clear that it, it does not change the gene, but it changed the expression of the gene. Yeah, right. right. And I, I don't know how many generations it can go on transmitting this, but presumably this thing that you've got locked up in a, a safety deposit box or something, the map of your own genome, probably has, includes some epigenetic um, clip-ons, you know, uh, attachments already. I don't know. Well, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, yeah. we uh, Well, to be seen, if we knew how to see it. But you're right. I, I don't know whether anybody can check it or not. 
Because presumably, if epigenetics is working, then all of us have some effects of our ancestors still floating around in our blood vessels and so on. Um, all of us have, our genome would be affected in various ways, and, but I bet you they can't, they can't specify that yet. I don't yeah. know. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think about genetic alterations? Um, quite apart from this epigenetic effects, there are also ways of going into this, this thing called CRISPR. Is that how you pronounce it? CRISPR? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It goes in and, and snips and, and rearranges and you could add or subtract real genes and that would be changing the DNA itself, right? Yep. Yep. What do you think of that? I mean, I uh, we're into talking about politics now. What should be the law? Why is it? Um, why do we have this sensibility that it's somehow immoral to change the human genome, where it wouldn't be immoral to change your, to change? Well, no, because we don't think that it's immoral. Because people, if they have something like um, some genetic defect, we're hoping that they could figure out how to take that gene out and replace it with a good one, right? So diseases, yes. they're trying to fix diseases, but not cloning, right? Well, there are diseases like, say, cystic fibrosis, where the body is not producing the right kind of protein for the muscles. So what they do is they take your cell, they, they modify some of your cells, multiply it, and now your cells can produce protein which is effective to, to feed up your muscles. So this is an example of going through the protein, you can fix a hereditary disease. But um, I wanted to ask you a, a more difficult question. Um, when you look at uh, what the DNA does, like you know, the book I'm reading is, has a thousand pages. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of that book. It's, the Bible of the microbiologist. No, so, I haven't, but I'm not a microbiologist by long shot. Um, this is Bruce Alberts and co-authors. Uh -huh. That's the Bible of microbiology. Uh, show, me, show me the cover again. I want to look at that uh, thing, that graphic. What is that? Uh, lift it up a little bit. I want to see the, the is that a cell? And, and those are things in the cell? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Uh, Very thematically. Now, I don't even understand enough physiology. No, cells, there's stuff oh, yeah. called stem cells, which are not differentiated that yet, right? And that cell on the cover must be a, a particular no. kind of cell, like a from the tooth or the... Yeah, the but it's too, it's too schematic. It can represent, it represents any cell. Okay. It's highly schematic. It's highly schematic. But I was going to ask you a very tough and deep question. When you read a book like this, you can see how life is extremely complex. Those 20,000 different kinds of proteins, they interact with each other. Did you ever organize a party at your house where you were contemplating having 20,000 people interact? Successfully? Okay. Well, your body does it. Okay, Michelle, uh, uh, let, let's, uh, I want you to finish your thought. And, and I, I do want to interrupt you, though, when you're through at a logical breaking point, because Adam has come in with a question from the audience, I presume. Right, Adam? Yes. Okay. Michelle, finish where we were going, and then uh, Adam will ask you. Well, that just first. briefly, I think that. The complexity of life is something to be admired by everybody. Of course, uh, absolutely. And it's stunning, it's sounding, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, bless you. Thank you for that. Adam, who, uh, has somebody, one of our viewers asked a question that you- Yes, um, Michelle, could, you, you've been talking about proteins. Could you maybe talk a bit about prion diseases and what a prion is and the risks associated with that? Well, uh, it turns out that these prions can 
pass on their shape to other proteins or other elements of the body in a negative way. So imagine, Adam, that if you're once you go outside today, you just pass close to someone or even start talking to someone. And if, if he has a disease, he passes it on to you just because his shape has modified your shape. That's how a prion works. So uh, I'm not very fond of prions myself. What happens? They, it, you mean if you're just in the vicinity of the other person and you change think, just because? I think contact, physical contact. Yeah. So your bad shape ends up modifying the shape of the other molecule or protein. Are there many of these things around doing this to us? Well, these prions were responsible for the death of several million cows in the West a few years ago. I have, I've heard about mad cow disease, but uh, that's the only time I've ever heard of prions or prions, whatever. Yeah, but that's bad enough. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not looking for more. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard there's a type, uh, just on that one, there's a type that can prevent people from sleeping too, that affects humans. Oh, really? Yes. Fatal, famil uh, fatal familial insomnia. But really? I think you answered their question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I want to go back, Michelle, to a, a more general discussion of GMOs. Because gene modification is being used, really implemented on a huge scale to produce new strains of, of food, of uh, plants. And uh, I guess also animals, I don't know. But there's, um, I, I've been politically uh, kind of torn because I, I'm a believer in science. I'm a believer in progress. I believe you know, growth of knowledge, uh, we, we have ways of improving things. But I'm skeptical about changing whole uh, species of, of uh, plants or animals in a way that could be permanent and could escape human control. So, for example, there's some farmer uh, who's sued, uh, I think, on, I don't know, forgotten which company, be, or he was being charged with stealing their proprietary uh, gene gene modified uh, grain of some kind. Let's say I don't remember whether it's wheat or what. And he was because it was growing in his field, and he hadn't paid for the right to do it. Well, he sort of sued them back and says, "Your plants blew over here and and landed in my field." accidentally and I don't want them and you get them out of here and I'm, I'm suing you because I don't want any GMO food growing in my property. I, I don't remember who won the case, but it was an extremely interesting case But because it does reflect the notion that once you have created a strain of any kind of uh, animal or plant, it, it has a life of its own that may take over and may do things that uh, you don't like. Um, so some countries have forbidden GMO uh, food. Tell me what you think about it. Well, just like you, I think we should be uh, much more careful. Um, you know, there are weeds that propagate. Um, my wife just showed me some weeds yesterday. She said, you see these weeds there? They're propagating like crazy. They come from China, you know, and nobody knows how to stop them. Uh, same thing with some kinds of fish, you know, there's kind of fish that's invading almost every river and lake in the United States. And pretty soon we'll be up in Ontario and uh, the Chinese carp or something. It came mm -hmm. by boat, you know, from China. Mm -hmm. So we are, we don't know enough about how to control life. And, you know, the DNA does that. So, it's like, you know, giving a sophisticated jet fighter to a 12-year-old child. How is he going to pilot it? Well, okay, but let's assume that, that these, uh, the, this CRISPR thing, CRISPR thing is, uh, is used to enhance the qualities of a particular gene, uh, genome. 
that uh, a, a strain of uh, rice or wheat or barley or something is, is created that is uh, theoretically better, more nutritious or faster growing or more somehow, you know, going to be able to feed the population of the world a lot better than the existing strains. That's the reason they do it. They're not doing it for malicious reasons. They're, they're doing it for good reasons, but they create this thing. Well, okay. Uh, how do we know that there's not a population of people in the world who, uh, who are going to be allergic to this or who can't digest this or who's, who are somehow themselves going to have their genome affected by eating this changed uh, genome? I mean, I, I, I can see why we might dislike the idea of tampering with nature. And certainly to the extent, I mean, we're, we take, nowadays they take genes out of fish and put them in turkeys and things. They move things around or they, they want to get uh, an animal that can stand cold, cold temperatures better. So they get, you know, they take something out of a whale or something and put it in and move it from even one species to another. All of this is uh, kind of a fun thing to do, but it is also, to my mind, pretty scary. And I understand why people object, but I personally, if I had to vote yes or no, allowing genome, uh, 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 gene modification in my, in Canada, I don't know which way I would vote. Well, you know, uh, the lawyers have gotten into this business. You know how the big German company, Meyer, was um, uh, acquired Monsanto? And, uh, and then They're they the had aspirin, the... Super aspirin manufacturer? Yeah. Buyer. So they, uh, buyer. Yeah, yeah, buyers. And the huge uh, German company bought yeah. Monsanto. And then they realized that, discovered that there was something like uh, several hundred court cases brought up against Monsanto because their pesticides and their modified wheat, whatever, were going, going all over the place and causing cancer in particular. So if the lawyers win and they have won important cases in California, Monsanto uh, buyer will have to pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, because of genetically modified stuff. So, uh, But now can they call it off? Can they say, aha, we've discovered this isn't so good, so now we won't produce any more of this. But it's already out there. I mean, what do you do? But they've, already, they've already caused the death of thousands of people through cancer. But suppose... So, the, this plant is still out there being reproduced and it's going to get future generations sick. Well, then there are going to be few future court cases well, and they'll have to pay more. Thing. That's a, just a good argument for saying you shouldn't allow it to happen because if it can happen in that instance, it could happen again and it will. Yeah. Maybe we should recommend to Elon Musk when he goes off to land on Mars to uh, grow different cultures there of, of um, suspicious plants on Mars. Then we'll be safe here. Don't bring them <laughs> home. <laughs> no room in the spaceship coming home, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But you tell me how you would vote. If, you had a, if we had a referendum in Canada saying, we want to ban the production of gene-modified food, would you... Would you vote for yes or no? Well, I think I would vote no for now because uh, there are no lots meaning of people, you would allow it to go on for now. So many people are dying of hunger. Yeah. We have to feed people, you know. So even if the food is not perfect, at least it keeps you alive. Uh, anyway, there are questions such as this one you're posing me, which are too difficult for me to answer. I'm just a plain physicist. <laughs> oh, I know. And that's where we, um, I think physicists and all other scientists should be 
socially engaged. You are. Now, don't, don't try to plead innocence that you, you are only a physicist and therefore you don't engage in political action because you do. And, and, and hats off to you for doing it. But I think many physicists would consider that you're not behaving yourself right if you go out there and picket or do uh, other things to protest against a, a policy that you have a poor opinion of. And, uh, and that, I think, is a pity because I think scientists really need to be involved and we need to understand the reasoning of scientists and the arguments of scientists as they consider the ethics of what they do in order to have any faith in science. And it seems to me the, the breakdown of trust in science has led us into a very, very bad situation. We're now, you know, a large proportion of the position of the population of Canada and every other country refuses to take the COVID vaccine because they don't trust science. And, you know, that's partly to blame that by the, for the scientists that they haven't come public enough to let people see that they're, they're honest people trying to make good decisions and, and engage with public affairs. So I, excuse my rant, but this is a, a view that I think is important that scientists should be engaged. And it should be part of the role of a scientist to explain well, I, to the I, public. I, I have been engaged. You know, I led the effort in Quebec to close down the Gentili 2 nuclear reactor. Bless your and heart. we succeeded. Mm -hmm. I know you do, and that's why I, I said hats off. No, but if I'm going to go out to picket on the street down in Toronto, I'd like to know the issue a little bit. You know, i like to know more about it before I stand out and picket. Um, and I cannot cover all issues. It's amazing that you can cover so many different issues in your program. I would never be able to do that. What? You mean this, this series of shows? Yeah. It's well, fun. you're covering six major areas. Yeah. Not a small thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's all superficial, but nevertheless, it's, I think, necessary, don't you? Can do I put a little ad, a, a little advertisement? Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, in Science for Peace, we have decided to ally with the uh, people who work for uh, climate control. I've been reading Seth Klein's book, mm -hmm. A Good War. It's excellent. You know, he's uh, Naomi Klein's brother, mm -hmm. and uh, he's got the right mentality. So I recommend his book, A Good War. I'm glad you recommended it. I've already done a talk show with him. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, a uh, couple, couple of months ago. Sure. I can... Uh, I can, you, if you go to our website, yeah. world.ca and you look at the videos, uh, there you'll be able to, to find his okay. uh, under the category of uh, global warming Good. And, uh, and click Good. on that and you can watch it there. So uh, Good. I, I agree. He's, he's a wonder and uh, it's, it's great to have him as an ally. And I, I'm very happy to see everybody signing up to, to help with that. Now, there's one more reason that you should have your DNA sequenced. Okay. Because it is remarkable that at your age, you're so lucid and so articulate and so interested in many different topics. It's unique. There may be one other person in Toronto who's like you, but <laughs> not more than one. That's a, the nicest compliment I ever heard. <laughs> well, uh, sure, I'll be happy to have my uh, genome sequenced. It had never occurred to me, but I, I, uh, I will not label it. Uh, this is to be opened only in the occasion when you need the one in 10, 10 million people <laughs> like Meta <Madison. laughs> Spectrum. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> okay, well, someday your genome and my genome will meet in some of somebody else's body and we will shake hands and say, nice to see you again, Michelle. True. <laughs> nice to Thanks. see you again. Amanda. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. I've enjoyed it. Okay. Me too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.